had to. And the, the, you can't stop those people because they believe what they're doing is right. Not even on a human moral base level. It's, it's my calling from God. They almost don't have a choice but to do it because it's what needs doing. Right. And, and that's terrifying because they, they don't care what your laws of man say because <laughs> my law says that I need to murder all these people and eat their organs. <laughs> <laughs> I listen to a lot of true crime. Wow. <laughs> I wasn't ready for the eating of the organs part, but, um, well, you know, there's time. Yeah. Yeah. So Zed then explains what the price of using the sword is. And to me, it was almost kind of silly. You basically have to see what a piece of shit you are. <laughs> and then opposite of that, you get to see what a good person, the person you killed was. It's basically you just have to feel guilty for killing somebody for a minute, which is a normal reaction after killing somebody. If you're a regular person, I would think. So almost no magical price to pay whatsoever. I mean, I know it is. It's probably amplified by the magic of the sword. But you're like, if you're a good person and you kill somebody, you're going to feel guilty already. Yeah. Like, I, I get that the the point of it is to try and um, kind of put a cap on the Seeker's power a little bit so that they're not just wildly out there slashing people to bits for no reason. You're guilty. Chop. You're guilty. Chop. Yeah. You're guilty. Chop. <laughs> um, Because, like... If you chop a little kid's head off and they haven't done anything bad, all you're going to see is how big of a piece of shit you are because the kid is literally just good. Right. Right. Exactly. The only protection from this is anger. And that's why it was so important for Richard to be able to prove that he could get angry and he could use his anger because if you're angry when you use the sword, it protects you from the price that you have to pay for using it. I think the other protection is killing bad like actually like shitty people because there are there's good in a lot of people most people have good parts and bad parts but there are people out there who are just bags of shit so if you're you're a good seeker then you should be targeting the bags of shit well i think you're right but i also think that it'll be easy to be angry at those kind of people yeah so it'll probably save your ass in the long run either way yeah yeah no, I agree with you. So far, the biggest piece of shit that we've met in this story, though, is Dark and Raw. And apparently, you're not allowed to use a sword on him, though. So you're telling me that there's this wizard or this evil ruler two lands away who's killing all these people to find me. And you give me this magical sword that can cut through diamonds as long as I'm angry and I can't use it on him. I felt like it was... A little bit of a bait and switch. Because this whole time they've been building the sword up, building the seeker up, and they're like, dark and raw, he's bad. Here's a sword. Take the sword. It's going to be awesome. You're going to do awesome things. And they're like, oh, by the way, we have some conundrums for you to figure out. Here's some riddles. <laughs> right. And Zed, he basically explains, look, the sword is a tool. And the seeker is the real weapon here, you know? And that's because Kalen says, well, it's impossible if he can't use the sword. Like, ah, well, fuck it. That game plan's done. <laughs> and he's like, no, no, you guys are missing the point. The seeker is the weapon. It's his mind. It's his heart. The sword is just there to help. It does make me wonder. I mean, obviously, Kalen didn't know about this little caveat here. And if she was like, the sword is the key. And, and now she's like, shit. Well, we're fucked. Zed's pretty proud about picking a good seeker, which I thought was a little bit funny because he keeps saying that he didn't actually pick him and that Richard picked himself. So Zed pats himself on the back for basically nothing right here. But that's OK. Right. They let him do it. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. And Kaylin apologizes for cutting down Zed's memorial tree. And Zed responds by saying, look, there could be no more fitting a tribute. She showed the truth to the seeker, which is, I mean... Pretty sentimental. <laughs> what? That was his wife. So you know that meant a lot. And this lesson cost Zed a lot to teach them. Yeah. It's pretty deep. Richard goes into some deep thought here for a minute. 
and he figures out the key to his first conundrum, <laughs> basically. His dad couldn't have had the book when the boundary went up. So the book must have crossed the boundary to get in. So there has to be a pass somewhere. Right, because the boundary couldn't have gone up if there was anything magic in Westland when it went up. Right. So he doesn't know where it is, but he knows that there's something like a bridge across the river type situation going on. He knows that somehow his dad got across. He knows it happened at one time. He knows there's a way, and he knows there's a way without a wizard getting you across, I think is the point. That just a normal dude did it. Yeah, just a regular guy, no magic, who was able to get across the boundary. Zen and Kaylin ask Richard what the plan is, because he obvi- he's like, here we go, we're going. We're going to go inside, we're going to get some food, and then we'll talk about everyone's plans. But Richard, where are we going? He's like, the Midlands. Duh. <laughs> I I had a little cheese there. I was like, come on, really? We're going to the Midlands, <laughs> Like, we didn't even figure out how to get out of the woods yet, dude. <laughs> but this is this is where I think you thought that yeah. the chapter ended. Because it, it was like a, a good ending place. Yeah, they, they learned their lesson. They're like, all right, let's make a plan. Let's go inside. Let's get some dinner. Richard had an epiphany. It would have been the perfect place to end the chapter. However, it's only halfway done. <laughs> but... Since they're not ending the chapter, I do think this is the perfect spot to do a beer break. Yay! (laughs) Jade and I both definitely need something to drink, as you can probably hear it in our voices. This week, we're drinking a beer called Melt My Brain by Shorts Brew. It's a golden ale brewed with coriander, juniper berries, and lime with tonic water added. Now, this beer, holy shit. (laughs) (laughs) It's weird, right? It is weird. I'm going to be honest with all of you guys. I don't want to like this beer. This is a very strong, a lot of lime flavor. And yet every time I take a sip, it grows on me. Mm-hmm. It's only a 4%, right? Yeah, it's not a very strong beer at all. Uh, 4% alcohol by volume. Very strong flavor. Real strong lime coming through there. Right? Yeah, yeah. A lot of lime. But I like it. I didn't want to like it, but I like it. The picture is interesting. Yeah. Um, somebody's got the large over the ear headphones like we're using right now. And it looks like the volume's turned all the way up because their hands are over the headphones. And uh, I think that girl's screaming. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very clear beer, too. I noticed that when we bought it, that it like, I don't know, it's weirdly see through. Almost looks like water. Yeah. That's the tonic water, probably. Yeah, probably. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back right after this. All right, and we are back. So, we cut to Richard, Kaylin, and Zed eating dinner, and Zed is trying to figure out just how the fuck Richard figured this problem out so fast. Because it's weird. And it's weird not to be able to tell your friends your thought process. Right, and he refuses to tell him. We spent the last two chapters trying to have Richard figure out this issue. Yeah. And the whole time, he's like, nope, guys, I can't do this. It's not on me. You two are the ones with magic. I'm just a woods guide. Let me think about it for 30 seconds. Oh, I got it figured out. Yeah. Well, how'd you do it? Don't worry about it. I I just know. I just I just know. You're going to send us all possibly to our desk just on a... Eh. Yeah. They go, Richard, we're your oldest friends. You know us. You can trust us. And he goes, well, I've had strangers tell me more. (laughs) I thought that was really funny. If I were Zed or Kate, like, if I was Richard's friend at all, I'd be like, excuse me, what the fuck? You know me, though, dude. I'm obviously not a stranger. I think they shut up, though, because, I mean, it was kind of a low blow, but it was also like, you really want to push this? You both done been lying. So, right. They probably didn't have much of a leg to stand on at that point. So they weren't going to try. Right. He's like, let me have my secrets, damn it. Or I will call you out on yours. And we don't want to go down that road right now. Let's eat our soup. Right. And, you know, since Richard can't tell anybody else about the book, he can't tell them how he knows there's a way. But at this point, playing devil's advocate, being Richard, 
wouldn't you tell your friends? Obviously, this whole mission is interconnected with everything that's going on and the guy and the confessor and the boundary and the the boxes of Orden. Like, wouldn't this be the time to finally spill the beans? I mean, I would think so. I almost said, how do you know that it wasn't Zed's book in the first place? Because Zed's got all these secrets. But Zed doesn't know about the book, right? We're assuming. Because of the... Uh- uh, past chapter, Richard kind of deduced that Dark and Raw might be after him because of the book, and Zed doesn't mention it, so he probably doesn't know. But I mean, maybe Zed's keeping that a secret too. But if that's the case, then Richard's probably like, "Well, fuck you! If you're not going to tell me, I'm not going to tell you." And it might also be some type of weird loyalty to his dead dad. Now that I could understand, Dad said the only person who gets this information is the owner and maybe he was waiting for Zed to be like damn it if only I had my book then we'd be able to figure this shit out real quick and be like oh you're the guy but that's not happening so he just can't say it that is the weird thing a little bit because the owner I'm assuming wouldn't just be walking around like where's the book of counted shadows I don't know where my book of counted shadows is And Richard doesn't exactly advertise that he wears this tooth. It's always under his shirt. So how are you supposed to hook up with the dude? It'd be one thing if Richard always wore the tooth out and Zed never said anything about the tooth. So anybody who recognized the tooth could be like, hey, that came from my pet dragon. You got my book, bro? That's right. The one thing he has that might lead him to the owner of the book... He hides away. You're absolutely right. Holy shit, I never thought about that. He's kind of shooting himself in the foot there. Yeah. You're not just going to talk to some random kid and ask him, hey, did you read my secret book? So, yeah. No. I think that's a little bit of a a weird thing. And the other thought that I had was not directly related to this. It was uh, one of our listeners, actually, two of our listeners, were a little bit upset because in one of our previous episodes... We called the boxes of Orden books of Orden, and we may have allowed the Book of Counted Shadows to be called the Book of Truth and Shadows. And I just want to say um, on air, sorry, I'm going to try to keep that straight. I, I really believe that that was fully alcohol induced. And <laughs> no. <laughs> and it hurt a lot when I listened to it, I promise. I was like, oh, that's going to be bad. Yeah, that's kind of cringy when you catch those <laughs> after the fact. Um, so, Boxes of Warden, Book of Counter Shadows, that's what they're called. Gotcha. <laughs> so, they continue making plans about the route they're going to use and what they should wear and what supplies they're going to bring. You know, last minute planning. As usual, Jade and I know all about that. (laughs) When the cat started acting funny. Now, this cat, I'm assuming, already acts a little bit funny because it's Zed's cat. (laughs) I have no proof. I'm just assuming. But when you see torchlight coming in through your window and an angry mob outside, it's never a good sign. No, no, probably not. No. As it was, there was about 50 men, good, hardworking guys but with torches and pitchforks outside Zed's house. And a part of me was kind of happy that this happened. A part of me was like, oh, good, a test run. You know, everybody's got their powers. Let's try them out for the first time with an angry mob. Richard's got a sword. They have a fucking wizard. The confessor does her thunder thing that we don't really know what it is yet, but it's pretty fucking powerful. And this seems just like the perfect opportunity for the reader to just see everything their group of heroes can do. But that's not exactly what happens. <laughs> not quite. And in a way, what happens is so much better. I've been looking forward to this for, I mean, since we started this book, because this is what I'm, I really like the scene. It makes me laugh. Yeah, this is a really, really good one. <laughs> <laughs> so with a big smile on his face, Zed asks the group, What's this then, boys? (laughs) And one of the guys, John, he kind of speaks for the group throughout this scene, says there's trouble about caused by magic and you're at the bottom of it. You're a witch. Caitlin stands in front of Zed, tells the mob, stop before you do something you regret, which if you're not a witch, then what's your plan exactly? Right. There's three people there versus 50 people. 
what is she going to do that's going to make 50 guys regret what they're 